In his book, Becoming a Knight, a consultant by the name of Morgan Snyder, he writes about meeting with a decorated U.S. Special Forces warrior who was a master sergeant and who was a master on the battlefield, but who struggled at home. The soldier said, I can't handle, I can handle any firefight. Uh, uh, and, and I can, I can handle uh, 300 men uh, ambush, uh, but that's no problem because I, I have objectives and, 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 the, and, and my mood in the war is clear. But my life at home, I can't handle that. My marriage, my kids, my mortgage, I'm failing. It's, it's, it's falling apart. He said, I feel like I live in Afghanistan. And, and, and I've been deployed to my home in Texas. I get that. I know what it's like to feel like a stranger in your home. There was a time that I I, I, I did that myself, but Joe, I, I, I didn't know where I belonged. There was a time when I was with, walking with Satan that I, I knew not where I fit in. And my marriage was in jeopardy. My children were in jeopardy. Pastor was, wasn't always saved. I remember the time when when I, was, when I was passed out on the sofa while my wife was at work and, and the children were, were doing their thing, unsupervised, unguided. And when she got home, the fog began to lift a little bit. So I tried to act as though, as though I was an adult male. See, I, I was acting like a child, but I didn't want her to see that. So I tried to act as though I was an adult male. But I say that to say this. That, that went out the window real quick. Because mother, she says to me, when I called home this evening, I asked the kids to put you on the phone. And they said they could not wake you. That's my story. I don't know what your story is. But see, this is, this is the road I traveled to get here. So when I thank the Lord for where he brought me, I mean that. I'm singing for myself. If nobody else, I got to pat myself on the shoulder because God has brought me a mighty long way. The product of one of those children stands in front of me at the usher board. God has blessed me even through my trials and tribulations to see the second and the third generation. A young man that's never seen me smoke a cigarette, never seen me take a sip of liquor, and never will. And never will. I, 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 I received that, mother, and never will. See, uh, Morgan Snyder comments that nothing is able to expose more of the unfinished places in us. than our marriage and our parenting. I had a dear friend, dear friend named Tony, and Tony, Tony met, he meant more to me than I can put in words. He was my friend for 30 years until he died. But Tony told me once, he says, Billy, if you want to know how people are living, you know, when you see them in church, all cleaned up and, and dressed up and smiling, you want to know how they live and follow them home. Follow them home. I invite any of you to follow me home. I, I got, a, I got a, a beautiful wife. I, I, have, I have an excellent marriage. My, my home is filled with the spirit of God. You won't find no smoking and no cussing. 
No beer chilling in the refrigerator. We speak to each other with compassion, with understanding. Somebody here may need to do a living amends. Because like Brother Morgan, everywhere it, it, it looks good, but your marriage and your parent skills, those are the hidden places in you that, that no man can see. But God sees them. Marriage and home life are the most difficult relationships in which we must learn to love well. See, you can't, you can't just get along with your, with your significant other, with your spouse. You got to love them as Christ loved the church. That's why many of you can, can have heard me, if not just come by and talk to me. But I, I tell you each and every one, every time I share with you, that I love you. That's agape love. That's, that's, not, that's not carnal love. I love you with the spirit of God. Unconditionally. Because I know we are made in error. We are born into sin. So I, I have no judgment. I, there is no condemnation in my heart for the way you live. I stand before you this morning and I tell you over and over again that the judge comes after me. Who am I to pass judgment on anybody that I know? I love you and I, and I mean that I love you. And, and anybody that knows about the goings on in this church knows that the, the solid rock will do anything for you. We ain't just blessing Joyce Myers and Jews in Jerusalem. We are serving our congregation. Those are not bragging points. That's because you have been a blessing in the lives of people that don't even know you. Somebody must be praying for you. See, I, I don't know what hungry is. I have never been hungry in my life. My father taught me that. Joe, my, my mother came home one day. I said, Ma, I'm hungry. My father said, boy, you ain't never been hungry in your life. <laughs> I had to think about that. I, I had never been hungry. I might have wanted something to eat. But there was always food on the table. There was, there was bread in, in the cupboard. I don't know what hunger is. But the Jews that we are, we are sponsoring uh, a, a thousand miles away, halfway around the world, they hungry. They're like squirrels picking up nuts off the ground. And you have been a blessing to them. That, that, that brings joy to my heart. I can finally say, I, you know, we want to be able to bless people. That, that should be your, your, your mantra. So when you think about it, if you ever think about you being hungry, just stop it, okay? Tell them, Pastor, say, hey, Pastor, I ain't never been hungry in my life, and you have not. But if you think you're hungry, come see pastor. I'll hook you up with a big old meal. <laughs> and just because you're hungry, I'll even let you take some with you. How about that? Huh? Because no one should be hungry. Not here in the United States of America. Hunger is for a third world country. I'm not going to go down that path. Because we need to love well. well uh, because they are the only place in which there is any possible uh, instances where we can hide our love. I come from a, con a, 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 a generation of, of men and women that hid their love. Growing up, uh, uh, men and women in, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, generation before me, uh, there were parents and, and mothers and fathers that slept in separate rooms. They didn't know how to you know, share their love. Um, I, I, I was... I was talking about that this morning I, in, in Sunday school. You need to come to Sunday school because there's a powerful message being delivered in Sunday school. And I said about a message that I heard in a song that says in the living days. The song says in the living days. And, and, I, and, and my father, I wish I wish I could have said that to my father in the living days. And my father's gone to glory. I'm on my way, church. I got to tell my father some things. Daddy, you, you missed some things. 
And so many things I want to talk to my daddy about. Not just my daddy, I got a son over there. I got a son. Gone to glory. And if I can just hug him one more time. I'll hug him for eternity. Don't make me no different. I love that boy. I love that boy. And he going to glory. So Dewan, if you're watching this morning, daddy love you, son. Daddy loves you. And would give him anything to, to, to sit with you toe to toe one more time. Some of you know my wife, but Pastor Joyce and I have just returned from what I think was, at, at, at least for myself, or uh, was of my first vacation in every sense of the word. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Um, family reunions <clears throat> and, and family reunions and um, a trip to the Holy Land. Um, those were special. Those were very special. I don't take anything from that. In fact, they are wonderful. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to say that that was a trip that I could just relax. Uh, what I say is, I could truly say that this last couple of weeks, uh, days that ended into another week, it was truly a vacation for me. One of those times where I was completely uh, shut off from the outside. No phone service and no television, um, very little computer. When you could get it, standing out there in the fields. <laughs> Just me and God. Just me and God. And don't get me wrong, there was plenty of good fellowship. We had a wonderful hostess and her family. And some of you even know Melissa. Melissa, you're joining us this morning. God bless you. Uh, uh, and, and many of you may have heard Melissa's story. I'm not going to tell her story because it's too wonderful for me to tell. She, she's got to tell it herself because when you tell it, Melissa, uh, people know that there's a God in heaven. But the ladies enjoyed themselves and they fellowshiped and they gathered together. But I had the opportunity to fellowship with my heavenly father. And let me tell you something, church. When you are surrounded by 40 acres, uh, it's easy to see God everywhere. Amen. Amen. Amen? 40 acres. The first thing I had to do when I got there was to look around. Everywhere I looked belonged to Melissa. Everywhere I looked was hers. The ponds, the hills, the trees, the farm, the llamas, the, the, the bunnies, the alpacas, all, all, all that was, was hers. So, so it's easy to see God when you, when you are in a place like that. Most people go away and leave all their cares behind them. But a shepherd... A shepherd's heart must always be with the flock, meaning you. And believe me, if I, if I didn't have such qualified leadership, somebody to, to stand in the gap, uh, uh, somebody who had a, a true heart for God and, and, and believed in, in doing well by their pastor, I would not have been able to take a trip like that. So uh, my gratitude goes out to evangelist uh, DeMaio and, 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 and his wife, Sister DeMaio, and, and, and of course, um, Sister Yemenez. <laughs> Sister Sarah, <laughs> for being so faithful. For being so faithful. that you just went on without me and did what you had to do. You were in place. And because of you, this serving this great ministry, it, the church was able to go on. We didn't have to lock the doors. If we, if we didn't lock them for COVID, I don't see no reason why we need to lock them because the pastor went away. Amen. So we have people that will stand in the gap. 
No one could do these things lest God be with them. Our Father in heaven took me to so many places in the spirit that I understood more clearly what, what Brother John, the revelator, I understood what John, what he meant when he wrote it in Revelation 21 and 10. He said, and he carried me away in the spirit to a high mountain. And he showed me the great city, that holy Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. I had an encounter with God. That's what he did for me. He, he carried me away. So when John writes in the Revelation, I know just what happened. When you get caught up in the spirit, God moves and even your surroundings disappear. You see visions. I, I saw visions. And, and, and that's, that's how God operates. Can I get a witness? It was then that I know that this was not going to be just a few days off. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So much was revealed that I wanted to bring back and share with you. So much. But the Lord literally had to remind me that I didn't have to preach the whole Bible in one Sunday. Amen. Take your time, preacher. There's, there's a lot of word to chew on. We'll get there. They'll keep coming. And, and that means that you just have to keep on coming back. Because the word that I have for you will roll over into next week and, and into the week after. You want to hear what the Father shared with me for you. Uh, it wasn't me being selfish. God said, you, you spending time with me. I'm, I brought you to this place. I've shown you what no one else has ever seen. Only you have seen this. And I want you to take this vision back to the solid rock. And let the people know that they serve a mighty God who is able to do all things but fail. So you just keep on coming to this little old church, sit alongside the road. One of the many things Jesus and, and I talked about was my role as your pastor and the direction that he is taking this church, this congregation. And I must never forget that you are God's people. You are not my people. Never let anyone say that he think that you his people. You are not my people. You are the congregation that I serve. I serve you. You are God's people. All of us here are called to lead. Not everyone is a leader in the church, uh, but you have families that you should be leading. You, there are people in your job uh, that should be following your lead, your understanding. Uh, so you and I must be willing to lead from the front. We must become an example of the power, not a power of example. Stop, stop. When somebody tell you a power of example, say, no, I'm not a power of example. I'm an example of the power. The God I serve lives in me. That's how I serve him. Beloved, the father said that if anyone in this congregation chooses not to lead, wants to take a seat in the family, on the job, that's fine. That's okay. But here's what God has for you this morning. If you don't want to lead, then please just sit down. Because God said, I'll raise up another. Amen. God don't need you. You need God. Amen. So if you, if you don't feel like leading, then, then it's okay. It's okay. Everybody can, because heavy is the head that wears the crown. So if you can't handle it, go sit down. God said he will, he told me to tell you, I'll raise up another. And, and they will walk in your blessing. Mm. I got people in this congregation right now this morning. I ain't going to call nobody's name, but they are walking in the blessing of another man. Yes, in this church. You don't want to do it. Just, just step aside. God will, 
will bring somebody else. God is too wise to make a mistake. And he had a plan for your life when he knitted you together in your mother's womb. What do you think all that was about? You were just born? This was just intercourse? This was just a sexual healing? God made you. And if God said it, that settles it. You don't have a choice. You got a choice, but you need to follow God. You think you were born just happenstance? With your own individual fingerprints? With your own individual mindset? With your own individual eyes? God, God did that. You are just stewards over those children. Those are not your children. Them God's children. How dare you, you destroy what God has put in, into place? Now, that's not condemnation. Many mothers have had to do that. Many, many mothers before they came to the Lord didn't understand the meaning of, of life. But that child that God has placed in your body is just as alive as the sound of the ones I hear this morning. What God has knitted together, let no man set asunder. God did it. And that settles it. That, that settles it for me. You know, huh? uh, kind of quiet. Let the church say amen. amen. Huh? Amen. This is not a lecture. This is, this is the truth. This is the gospel. And the gospel is the good news. Amen. Receive it with love. Ain't nobody coming here to be condemned. When you leave out of here, you should be informed and enlightened and walking in the spirit of God, in, 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 the, in the spirit of the sunshine, in the light of, in the, light of the kingdom. You should, you should be coming. This, that's the mission field. Here you get your glimpse of the promised land. And you have given the opportunity as you sit to prepare your, to prepare your message. You heard it here. You heard it there. You know what God said this morning. I ain't going to go there, but it just brings me back to today's message. The battle is not yours. Amen. Pastor Jay read today's text from the King James Version of the Bible. And, and if many of you like me, um, I have several translations out before me when I'm studying and I, I spread those Bibles around me. I know Evangelist has several uh, uh, um, translations. And, and when I study, I, I, I seek those translations, but among them always is the King James. I, I always, that's my go-to, is the King James. But I, I, I read other translations which sometimes give me a clearer, a clearer understanding. That's all, that's all. It's just a matter of the translation. Beloved, make no mistake, King James is forever the Bible that you should go to. Every translation that you get, let me tell you, it's, it's like back in the day, we used to have tape recorders. Um, and, and, and once you make the original recording, Every recording you make after that become it loses it's it's a it loses something in that translation. It, it's not as clear. It's, it doesn't sound as fresh as the first translation sounded. It's, it's just like the sitting in church this morning. Some of you are hearing one thing, and some of you hearing Satan. You know, some of, some some folks don't even care what he had. Satan walk right in and speak in your ear. That happens all the time. That don't amaze me. I'm a preacher. People don't live, they, they don't care about that outside. You're here because you want to understand what thus saith the Lord. I'm here because I had the experience. I was on the mountaintop and I saw you and he showed me where we going. That's why I'm, I, I can speak those things into the lives of the people I serve. Amen. Amen. Hey, amen. So, so, when we read the Bible, <clears throat> we should be seeking understanding. There, there are several translations. I, I use the message. I use the NIV. And for that, that verse that uh, Pastor uh, Jay spoke this morning in, in Proverbs, fourth chapter, and verses one to four, I want to read that for you from the um, NIV, the New International Version, because of the translation. Um, it, it reads like this. Beautiful, beautiful. Listen, my son, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. 
For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the same verses in a different translation. So out of over the 3,000 proverbs that that, um, Solomon thought about, 513 of them are written in this book. That's a whole lot of thinking, quite a bit of meditating. The word Proverbs means to be like. Thus, this is a book of comparisons between common concrete images and life's most profound truths. Simple moral illustrations that highlight and teach the fundamental realities about life. In 2 Chronicles, in the first chapter, verses 7 through 12, 2 Chronicles, in the first chapter, verses 7 through 12, Solomon was offered by God himself to ask for anything he desired, anything in the whole world that he desired. And what he asked for so pleased God that the creator of the universe, the the Alpha and the Omega, threw in every other gift just to make weight. (laughs) Look at me, if you will, as if you have it in your your Bibles, 2 Chronicles, first chapter, verses 7 through 12. In that night, God did appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give you. This is God. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David, my father. This young man had been sitting at the feet of David in Bathsheba. See, that's true. His father, can you imagine your father telling you how he killed a giant? Took a rock to a sword fight? This this is David's old man. He says, he says, And Solomon said, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. This is is what the passage this morning. My son, hear what I say to you. Solomon is saying, Now you made me king. O Lord, O God, let thy promise come unto David my father be established. For thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. See, I've I've never passed this many people. This is a great congregation to me. This This is like the multitudes of the dust. This many people from all walks of life, from different parts of the country, Shanice and the Bahamas. So I, I get that. I get that. And so I'm trying to interpret that for you, the translation, what we just read. Now, O Lord, let thy promise unto David, my father, be established, for thou hast made me king over many people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I might go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this, thy people, that is so great? We were just, I can't judge you. And God said unto Solomon, because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked for riches, for wealth, nor for life, or the lives of your enemies. Neither yet hast thou asked for long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. God, God shared that with me. These ain't your people. These my people. But you asking me for wisdom and, and understanding, I will give you that. 
so that you can lead my people. Verse number 12 says, Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches, wealth, and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there be any after thee to have the light. See, that's how I know you're blessed. God has blessed my life. My riches don't come in dollars and cents. I'm, I'm, I'm like Melissa when she, when she goes out her door in the morning and sees 40 acres. That's, that's, that's her riches. God throws that in. But what God has given to me and my wife is, is, is as great as 40 acres. He, I, don't, I don't need God to add on to my legacy. I'm doing wonderfully. But the people that I serve, this is, I ask Solomon like Solomon. Every, I, I beg God on my knees. Please, God. Please, God. Give me wisdom and knowledge. I know you're not going to give me like Solomon, but give me some. Give me enough that I need to lead your people. And, and as I sat there with the Lord pondering these things, I was given clarity. And now I understand what the gift of salvation really is, church. And I'm going to drop this off for free because now I've learned what gift means to me. It means, God, I'm finally thankful. Finally. I get it. I'm 70 years old. But I'm finally thankful. So, so God has blessed me. And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, and, and I've learned that, beloved, the battle is not yours. Children of God, we no longer fight for the victory. Instead, we fight from the victory. And what that means is that simply the battle is not yours. We've come too far, church, to turn back now. And the very same God that forgave all our sins and washed us white as snow gave his only begotten son. His son was to pay a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. Can I get a witness? Amen. Beloved, who wouldn't serve a God like that? I might be the only one, but in this church, I'm sold out. He's brought me too far for me to turn back now. First John 1 and 9 says, if thou confess with your mouth, God will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Of all your sins, parenthetically, John 1 and 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins, and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All you got to do is tell them I did it. Don't act like you didn't do it. Don't act like you didn't think it. Amen. How you going to stand before God and ask for a brand new, a brand new car? Ask, ask God to, to, to move in your life, and you have not asked him to take away that thought, to take away that behavior. That's, that's why I can, I can say that about my grandchildren, because I ask God, Lord, please. Don't let me live like that again, ever again. Beloved, where will you be when the fighting starts? Believe me, there's a war coming. So are you going to be standing on the sidelines where you think that you will be safe? Or will you join the angels and jump into the battle? Beloved, how many times must I tell you before you believe with every fiber of your being? that we fight not for victory, but we fight from victory. Amen. amen, amen. Can I get a witness? As the pastor and the shepherd of this great church, let me fill you in on this battle that is coming. And it could be any day now. Any day now. Because desperate men and women are being dropped off all over our country. All over. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. But they are here out of desperation. And soon you will not be able to look the other way. See, a whole lot of looking the other way is going on. People are not, not paying attention to what's going on. But right now, as we speak, desperate men and women, desperate men of war, fighting age. These ain't no old men like me. These young men are filtering into this country, and we don't know where they're going. So I want to tell you something. Desperate men do desperate things. Okay, 
Desperate men do desperate things. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to belabor that. I'm going to leave you with that. But again, I'm just the messenger. You see, uh, the judge comes after me. This war is going to be on the spirit world right now. But it is about to spill over into the physical. And church, this is not a war about money. It is not a war about things. This is not a war about boundaries. The victor of this war receives the souls of men. That's, that's what I come to tell you this morning. The battle that is being fought now is for your very soul. Amen. So when, 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 when it comes time to fight, you, you, you might want to get in the fight. Because three, one, two, three, three billion, no, three trillion, three trillion years in eternity, and you will not have taken one second off the clock of time. I can't be separated from God that long. I don't want to be nowhere but the promised land when time stops and I step from time into eternity. If the battle is for my soul, I'm fighting. If the battle is for you, I'm going to be there. If the battle is for my wife, I will stand with her until the end. And that is my message for you this morning. If you are not going to, to, to allow this word to, to come back and get into your spirit, I'm preaching it. Don't let it come back void. Uh, it will not be charged against me. When Jesus opens up the book of life, you will not be able to say you have not heard the gospel. Every word in this book must be inerrant and infallible. This is the word of the great I am. And you will not hear any other word being preached from behind this sacred desk. Beloved children of God, the battle is not yours, and I will not allow you to be deceived. And, but the Holy Spirit uh, would, would, would not allow that either, because the victory has already been won on a hill called Calvary. <laughs> uh, can I get a witness? Amen. The victory is already won. Beloved, Proverbs contains the principal applications of Scripture, which uh, godly Christians uh, of today, we, we must illustrate in our lives. Notice I say the godly Christians because everybody that goes to church ain't saved. Amen. But everybody that's saved goes to church. So I know you saved. I know you saved. But don't think everybody go to church. Your neighbors and all them folk down the street, they ain't saved. They're not saved. Some folks go to church sitting in church thinking about baseball. Thinking about, thinking about later on. See, I, I've been, I've been in, in, in church with that same attitude. But now I sit in the right now waiting on the not yet. Because I know God got a blessing for me. The battle is not over. Everyone that is saved is here this morning. So you see, the magnitude of this war cannot be overstated. We must have victory at all costs. Because the stakes are extremely too high. You, you fight not only for your soul, you fighting for their baby's soul. You fighting for your, your spouse's soul. You fighting for the congregation's soul. And, and church, hold on tight because what don't kill you will only make you stronger. Amen. I've been there. Some of we got, we got, we got, we got ex-military in this, in this congregation that made it through the war. What don't kill you only makes you stronger. You know how to fight the good fight. You know how to survive like this young man that said he, 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 he didn't know how to heal his marriage. How can you not know how to heal your marriage and you done been in, in a war? How can you not survive? People in war don't fight for, I'm not fighting for me, I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for the man next to me. That's what war is. War ain't about me fighting for myself. It's about fighting for the man next to you. Look around, church. That's who you're fighting for. Your very soul is at stake. Solomon says it well in, in the 23rd verse of the same chapter. Same chapter, 33rd verse. And he goes so far to say, uh, and it's been my experience, so I, 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 can, I can quote this you know, even without, without, without reading it. 
But he says, keep thine heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Praise God. Praise God. Pray. My heart is so filled up with the joy of the Lord. And, and, and when I, out of my heart flows the issues of life. People don't even, people don't even know me. My wife can attest for this. And, I, and, it's, and I'm not saying at the risk of sounding arrogant. We have gone places and people, strangers, have come to me and asked me, are you a pastor? I don't, I don't wear that. I don't advertise that. But people, people see that. And of course, I say yes. Because out of my heart comes the issues of life. I speak life to people. I don't speak borders. I don't seek presidents. I talk about life in Jesus, the love of God. Think, if you will, for just a moment that Solomon is saying here to the church today in this chapter that reads like a love letter. Uh, it, and, and, and if your spiritual father called by God himself to show you a few of his humble servants the way to the kingdom, you need to be taking that to heart. Beloved, I urge you to follow me as I follow Christ. And if I stray from the path, and even if my speech is abusive, I encourage you to get and flee from me. Stop following me. Stop listening to me. You have my permission. Because the Holy Ghost will reveal to you all the actions of a fraud. Amen. And he will not allow you to be blinded by false doctrine. I've seen a lot of that. I'm going to tell you how powerful God is. There was not that long ago, two years ago, there was so much false doctrine going around that God shut down the world. Amen. Shut it down. Shut down, the churches. shut down the entire planet. The implied, everywhere on the planet shut down. God, God, God willed it, just moved his hand. So when Jesus speaks to the wind and, and says, peace be still, God said, I'm shutting it down. They lie unto my people. They telling them some, pro what is a prosperity message? I can see him talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. What is this prosperity message? I, don't, I can see the Holy Spirit. I don't know. He said, we need to shut it down. And in 2020, every church in the world except this one, and, and I know there were one or two others, but except this, I'm thinking about my flock. Every church in the world except this one, brother guy, was open. You were there. We never closed our doors. And the Spirit of God dwelled among us. We were blessed by the, by the angel of mercy. He passed over. Death was on every side. Death was on. People were dropping in the street. They were carrying by. They couldn't even bury them. They were just stacking them up. And we did not have one incident of COVID-19. You ain't got to say amen. 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 Because I didn't, I didn't get it. I know what God did for me. That wasn't no small thing. No, no, God, God was, 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 was able to do for me. So I'm telling you now, you want to get into the battle, we will be there. My wife and I, we will be there. And if you're going to fight everybody in this congregation, call themselves members of the Solid Rock, I know that they will be there as well. Amen. Don't think you got to fight this fight alone. We are ready to walk like a Christian. It's time to talk like a Christian. It's time to put away childish things and put on the full armor of God. Stop ta taking from people and, and stop asking for foolishness. Stop doing the things that you know are not Christ-like. When people see you, they need to say, you must be a child of the king. I can tell by the way you behave, by the way you speak. We should be ready to speak the word in every situation, in every Every, every person we come to, in and out of season, because the word of God cuts both ways, like a two-edged sword, cutting by the bone and the marrow. You know what that is? When you, when you bite a chicken bone, Joe, and, and you see that little brown in the chicken bone, the, the word of God cuts between that and the bone. Skin that right off the bone. That's the word of God. But it only does that if you got on the full armor. Put on the full armor of God, church, because the battle is not yours, but it's being fought. And if it was fought, it was right there on the Via Della Rosa when my Savior, Jesus Christ, beaten and bruised, carried all my sins 
through the streets of Jerusalem. I've been there. The humiliation of my God as he walked the Via Dolorosa, beaten and broken and bruised, spit on, talked about, carrying all my sins up a hill called Calvary. The battle is not yours, church. When he looked up with the blood in his eyes and, and, and like sweat, it was running down his face. And, and I can tell you, if you ever been sweaty and in the sweat, I, I go to the, I go to the gym. I know I know I look great. I go to the gym and when I, and when I, and when I when I'm sweating and, and and the sweat runs down, sometimes you just want to take your hand. You got to take your hand and wipe it out your eyes. And I and I think about my Jesus, when he needed to wipe the sweat off his face, he couldn't even see. He couldn't help it. He had the weight of the world on his shoulder. And through his pain, he never said a mumbling word. The battle is not yours, church. All the way up that hill called Golgotha, he was stumbled and he, and he staggered, but he held this in his mind. You and I, he had my name in his mind, telling himself that he would not die for me, but that he would die instead of me. He never said a mumbling word. The battle is not yours. And I'm sure that if it had been me, I would have cried out, Oh, Lord, have mercy on me as they drove the nails into his hands and into his feet. But the Bible says that he never said a mumbling word. It was the master's fate. It was his destiny. He never said a mumbling word. It was what he had to do. It was, it was something he had to do. No one else could have done what he did. All of us together could not have done what he did because the battle is not yours. And my Savior hung on the cross from the morning until the afternoon, right through the hottest parts of the day. And through it all, he was still a God of love. What they heard him say was, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. <laughs> Beloved, the battle is not yours. And as he hung there into his final hours, when he just had to say something, when it was finally over and he had done what no other man or woman could do with his dying breath in Matthew 27 and 46, he said, in the ninth hour, Jesus was heard with a loud voice crying out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That means, oh God, Oh God, why have you forsaken me? My Jesus, my Savior, he died instead of me. It was supposed to be me on that cross. 